Welcome to the SAMPS Podcast, bringing you advice and insights from sales and marketing professionals in life science. Hello everyone, this is Harrison Wright with SAMPS, that is, serving sales and marketing professionals in scientific research. I'm here also with Robert England, who is a founding member of Up There Everywhere. Now on the 18th of June, SAMPS will be holding a conference in Gothenburg in Sweden, and Robert will be presenting a talk entitled Marketing to People with Emotion Rather than Data. Robert, uh, there's a few threads I could pick up on here, but uh, the human side of marketing and life sciences is something that's got quite a bit of, uh, it's had quite a bit of discussion going around in this community for a number of years. But one thing I really noticed is that you make the case that scientists are the most emotional human beings. And that's that's quite a claim. I've not heard that before. Can, can we hear more about that? Yes, yeah, thank you, Harrison, for leading in with that question. Yes, I think it's because really it's the, the, the dichotomy between why you do anything uh, for a living, you know, are you doing it for the money or are you doing it uh, because you believe in it? And there I think scientists lean towards the side, much more to the side because they believe in it. You know, actual, actually in the sense that scientific remuneration is not the best in the world. They could be doing a lot of other things like working for pharmaceutical companies and earning lots of dosh there. But they've chosen a path to do scientific research for a particular reason. And that reason is a very human reason because they believe in making a, a mark for themselves and, 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 and doing a purpose and, and fulfilling a purpose in life. That's, a, that's actually a really interesting insight. You know, I, I've worked in four or five different industries over the years, you know, others being oil and gas, for example, and industrial engineering. And I noticed when I got into life science initially that there's a large percentage of the people that were driven much more by the content and, and outcomes of the work they were doing mm-hmm. rather than the traditional things people are driven by in work. But I never made that connection with emotion. No. In fact, I think that we're touching upon a subject which I think becomes very close to our industry and one I think that you'll appreciate personally, and that's the idea of content. And where content shouldn't necessarily be talking about how much money you can make or how good it is for your business and what kind of productivity growth you can make, but why it's good in general for humanity. And I think that's a subject that is often the, the one that really grips people. The idea that this is for the good. I won't make any comparison to a greater good, but it's for the good. And, and that's where I'm, I'd like us at least focus some attention during the talk and the, the trends in the industry we see towards that. That's really, really something. I think if that was actually applied in the real world, the distinction in the messages that would be coming out would be significant. If you look at, if you look at your traditional fact-based marketing campaign in, in life science. It's along the lines of you know, this instrument is X percent faster than that instrument or so on. And then you go one level deeper and it, instead of talking about technical specs, they might talk about you know how how you have this problem in the lab and this instrument will help you solve that problem and achieve these benefits. But that's still talking about the personal benefit to you or, or the collective benefit to the lab. But this, this goes a level beyond that. Indeed, it does. It goes well beyond that. Because it's talking about factors that are true human motivators, which is to do something that nobody's done before. That could be one of them. It could be towards improving the very nature of research by bringing tools to bear upon upon the community and, and, and to, to, to derive more knowledge in a certain area. And we see that in many aspects. We see that in, in, in you can say it's a black, it is both the dark side and the light side. Look at CRISPR, for example, in Cas9. It can be applied for the good, for sure, and it could also be applied to great evil. And I think there we have areas to explore. How is it going to be brought to bear? We have to do good for humanity. How can we ensure that legislation is in place? How can we ensure that research is given the freedom it needs to explore avenues? And I think these are all subjects that really touch upon the hearts as well as the minds of scientists. Absolutely. Robert, this might be a, a tall order for our conversation today, but do you have any examples, compelling examples that come to mind of companies that have done this successfully? Well, that's a very interesting question, Harrison. I think we're on the cusp of it. We're working with clients now, I, and I'll refrain from mentioning their names, where we're really trying to get their raison d'etre on the table, which is, of course, a very major part of branding you really have to tell people or even help them ask the question, why do we go to work every day? What are we trying to do with our lives? What are we trying to do with our work? 
And that is central to branding. That's the purpose, or you might say the vision and the mission of the company. I think getting it to reverberate means making it as close as possible to the company's real DNA. Otherwise, it's just so many words. And this is really one of the crucial aspects of branding. It's actually being authentic. And authentic means understanding the company deeply. And that requires a lot of specialism. It requires specialist knowledge within life science. It, it, it requires enough knowledge to be able to actually understand what your counterpart is talking about when he's briefing you. And I believe it also requires creativity to actually create a dream, if you will, if, if I can may, maybe so bold as to go that far, but to create a vision for the future that people really want to embrace. And I think that so branding at the very highest levels is just that, creating a mission that people really believe in. And even and every single um, every single ex, uh, example of what you do should be true to that vision. And so it should really impact every single communication that you put forward. Something that I find really interesting about this that maybe is, is coming at it from another la- angle that a lot of people wouldn't think about is on the one hand, which is what we'll be mostly concerned about, this can be applied outwardly in terms of marketing and communications for the market in general, but it can also equally, or maybe just as importantly, be applied inwardly to creating the right company culture and attracting and retaining the best staff. Very much so. I think that there is a very strong link between branding as you head out towards the market, if you will, to the world, and values, which is very much how the company is driven. And there should be a, definitely, you know, that it's one of the, the central beliefs set up that branding and human resources should go hand in hand. You know, they should be singing in the same hymn sheet, if you, if you like, that, that human resources is completely in line with the values that, that, that you've set for the company that then reflect upon the, the, the vision that you're trying to achieve. So we strongly believe in the fact that there should be unity right the way through the organization. Definitely. And, and I think this topic is especially timely right now, seeing as the, the there's been a, a slowly growing and now it seems to me rapidly expanding trend for companies to be uh, not just externally, but internally as well about purpose and vision and uh, and all those sorts exactly. of things. Exactly. And I think it's really poignant at this point in time in the, in the trends in life sciences because there's so many consolidations going on. So many companies merging, so many acquisitions being made that a lot of the original life science companies are kind of losing their soul or losing their, their mojo. And I think, bring, you know, and a lot of um, heads of divisions would, or heads of or corporations would poo poo the idea that we should even try and maintain some of the ethos that the previous companies that they purchased should, should be maintained in favor of the, 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 global, the global brand. And I find this to be one of the most exciting mega trends that we're facing today in our industry. The consolidation of the life science industry, I think, is if not as, as big, but it is as active as it was in the 90s for the pharma industries. Definitely. And uh, I, it's, it's an interesting thing about this industry with all the consolidation is that uh, there aren't that many mid-sized companies anymore. It's the giant conglomerates and it's the small companies. And in many ways, the... The, the small companies are struggling more and more to compete with the conglomerates, and this could be an avenue for them. You're absolutely right. I think um, just like Pharma did in the 1990s, they, they realized they were best at marketing and distribution, and they left a lot of the innovative work to the companies that they acquired, hopefully you know, ring-fencing them for some time so they can get on with their, with their innovative you know, um, DNA or get on with their innovative power. And I think the same thing is happening today. But the interesting thing is, I don't see why there should be any need for that, that particular point of energy, that, that innovative center, the innovative heart of the company, to be completely blanketed and, and forgotten about. And I think they should have their characters recognized and nurtured. So I think it's one of the most important things that even as the conglomerations occur, let the company's innovation power speak out. And I think Millipore actually done a very good job and recognize that Merck Millipore with their new, among other things, that campaign uh, of that curiosity. 
Absolutely. Oh, another another kind of left field question for you, Robert. There's. Mm. It, it strikes me that the, the the way that this would work most optimally is if it's integrated at every level of an organization. But let's say, let's say you're attending the the SAMPS conference. You're, you're someone who's mm. going to hear this full talk, and you're a mid-level marketing manager for one of the larger corporations. Clearly, you wouldn't have that level of influence. But is there a way to apply this in some form on a, on a ca- campaign level or a, a tactical level, rather than to the entire mm-hmm. organization and still get some benefit? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Well, first of all, I'd just like to contend that anybody at the middle management level should feel that it is their duty and it's their, within their power to influence higher up. And I, I'd urge them to do so because I think some of the best ideas come from grassroots or close to the close to the client. But let's take an example, for example. I think one of my favorite examples these days is um, is content, which is very much the mainstay of people at the middle management level, creating content around their product or around their technology so that they're found on the internet. And uh, we find, of course, that content is very important today, not just for companies, but even for organizations like ourselves. We get found because of the content that we're publishing content that's relevant and meaningful to the audience that we're seeking to to engage with. And of course, that all comes down, of course, to Google search and the amazing power that it, it gives them, it gives anybody uh, to find to find companies, services and products that uh, that meet your needs. And interestingly, in this conglomeration world, in this consolidation world, I should say, companies are losing their specialists. And as they head to, towards the more generalization of their businesses, and that's something which I find remarkable. I've seen it time and time again over, met, over the years that I've been working over this decade. And as I said, it's reminiscent of the, the consolidation that pharma companies uh, made in the 1990s. It's, it's as if there's spin-offs happening in every aspect of the, of their, of the industry. And, um, but life science, if any industry you're going to talk about, but life science in particular is still in very strong need of quality content. We know that the avenues by which people find out information are changing and content must be very, very good in order to attract somebody and make them, make them stay. So we went as far as to say back in 2010, hey, everybody, guess what? The implication of this is that from now on, we're all publishers. We are all publishers. And I expected companies within life sciences to start to refine their departments or their their organizations so that they became publishers. I expected them to be their, their dot net dot dot uh, dot publisher of, of their particular technology expertise. But that isn't the case. What we're actually seeing instead is um, content, people searching for content experts outside of their four walls because they don't want them to be that particularly close to their product anyway. They want them to give them a better view of the industry or of the technology. So if I'm going to make a bold statement of the future, what I think is that we're looking at the democratization of information, even in the life science sector. You know, in the same way that we're getting democratization with open access, in the same way we're going to get democratization with the internet in general, I think the life sciences business is going to have a lot of voices uh, where, of course, knowing our industry, they're not going to accept any old rubbish. They're going to have to be voices that show by evidence, by publication, by reference, or by expert opinion that the content they're publishing is is valid. So what I see in the future is our distributed teams around the world of experts addressing life science, addressing medical device, addressing healthcare, addressing, if, if you will, even... Um, uh, the digital medical future. And I think they're, they're going to be thought creators, thought leaders that are nurtured and spend their time working on creating great content that meets the needs and actually exceeds the needs. Might even be actual industry changing as these as these forces come, come, uh, come to bear. Robert, it's quite a vision. And I, I have to agree with you that the, you, you, you were, you were talking to people about the future of content nine years ago, and still, it's to this day, it's quite a wide open playing field. But I'm, I'm seeing the, 
want for innovation in life science marketing increasing a lot in the last couple of years. So hopefully it won't take so long. No, it's, life science is a conservative business. I'm sure of that. And in fact, I've t- dipped my toe in other businesses, other domains as well, such as IT. And there I say they're slightly ahead of us. Actually, interestingly, they are a relatively um, uh, conservative business as well. But their need for content is huge today and very, very specific content. And I see the very, very same um, trends affecting life sciences within the next five to 10 years. So thanks for that point. You're welcome. Well, thank you, Robert. I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much, Harrison, for this interview. I really appreciate it. Meet you in Gothenburg. You're very welcome. And uh, for everyone listening, uh, we'd love to see you there. It'll be again on the 18th of June, 2019. You can register online at sampsoc.org. Uh, I'll spell that for you. It's S-A-M for mother, P, double S-O-C, sampsoc.org. So we'll look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, everyone. To get more from Stamps, visit www.samp.org.